What's up there, good peoples? I believe we are live. Just change this really quick. I guess that's good enough. Wait till some people come in. All right. So we are talking today about um, the foreclosure process. Um, we're talking about um, how uh, how to purchase foreclosure properties here in the state of Connecticut. And I've got um, attorney David E. Rosenberg here that, that uh, we're going to be talking to. If you guys have any questions at all whatsoever, if you have any questions, feel free to, um, to, to leave your questions in the, uh, in the comment section. Um, and, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how many of those we can get to. All right. So, um, so yeah, so, uh, a little, little bit of information for you. Um, I do get a lot of inquiries about foreclosures. Everybody wants to, uh, not everybody, but many people want, want to buy foreclosure properties. Um, one, one big reason is that they, a lot of people feel that, uh, you know, when you buy foreclosures, um, you can get great deals. Like it's automatic. You know, if, if you buy a foreclosure, you, you must've got a great deal. That's not necessarily always the case. Okay. Um, so, uh, but we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and we'll also talk about the three phases to buying foreclosure properties. All right. The three phases, um, just because you hear somebody bu uh, bought a foreclosure property doesn't mean that they necessarily bought it at, at the same phase or, or the same time period within that foreclosure process. All right. Um, so there are three phases, three phases to the foreclosure process. The first phase, and we're going to talk about this uh, in further detail when I bring on the attorney, but the, the first process, the first phase, I should say, is the uh, the pre-foreclosure. And that's basically um, the the sellers have uh, been told that um, that the bank is considering foreclosing on the property and they need to do X, Y, Z, so on and so forth. Um, and that is the pre-foreclosure um, uh, phase of the foreclosure process. And that is when people can, can uh, purchase the property with a short sale or, or, or something like that. Once again, I can go more into detail in a little bit as to what a, a, um, a short sale is. After that is the auction process, uh, the the, uh, the foreclosure auction. And that's basically what, whereas you, you have uh, um, the, the bank is foreclosing on the property and they are trying to sell it to a, um, to a new owner. Um, but there are a lot of pitfalls at this stage in the foreclosure process. There's a lot of pitfalls. Um, I personally suggest that if you don't know what you're doing, mm, you may want to consider one of the other uh, phases of the foreclosure process because there, there's, again, there's, there could be a lot of pitfalls here. Um, you could find some gold as well. So, so not, that's not to say that you shouldn't buy at, at that stage, but uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, and then finally is the REO or the real estate owned phase of the foreclosure process. All right. Um, so I'm going to bring on attorney Rosenberg right now. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the foreclosure process. And by the way, if, if anyone is interested in, um, in purchasing uh, property, whether it be a foreclosure or what have you, obviously you can uh, shoot me a DM um, and uh, you know, I can help you out with that. All right. So here is attorney Rosenberg. How you hey, doing, Cameron, sir? How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing, Cameron? Awesome. Awesome. Definitely want to first thank you for, uh, for jumping on here with me. Appreciate um, it. Have, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we put our names on here so everybody knows who we are. Um, where we at? Here we go. There we go. All right. So, um, so yeah, so, so you do some, some, you are a real estate attorney. I'm a real estate attorney and, and I like to tell people all the time, attorneys are a lot like doctors. You know, you may have the greatest neurosurgeon in the world. If you have a heart problem, it doesn't know no good. You want to have somebody who really specializes in that particular area. And this, this is what I do. I do real estate, both residential and commercial. I do a lot of litigation that's related to real estate matters, you know, business formations, collections, evictions. I don't handle anybody's bankruptcy or family disputes or, or you know, criminal cases. Right. Right. That's a very important uh, topic because, you know, I, I do see sometimes where someone will say, um, you know, I ask them who are going to use to represent you in this particular transaction. And they'll say, well, I have a family attorney, but they might be a criminal law attorney or what have you. So excellent point there. Uh, it's very, very true. Um, and so, so you're saying this is basically what you do. This is um, every day. This is what I do. Right, right. Do you, um, 
Do you do a lot of foreclosures? What exact what exactly is your role in the foreclosure process? How does that look? So in in earlier in my career, I actually worked for one of the big foreclosure mills in the state. So I used to do a lot of bank representation. We did everything from defaults all the way through judgments to resales and REOs and everything along those ways. Uh, since I've left there, I do a little bit of bank work, but more so on, on the consumer and the investor side in terms of helping them understand uh, the foreclosure process, man, you know, go through those three phases that you were talking about earlier, uh, and work on both acquisitions and and you know, um, uh, de you know, default servicing and loss mitigation options. Mm. Cool. So let's talk a little about the uh, about the processes. Um, so, so yeah, like I said, a lot a lot of times people will, will come to me and they say I want to buy a foreclosure property because they feel that that it's going to be a great deal, uh, not really necessarily knowing um, all that comes with that. Okay. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so we're going to start with the um, with the, uh, the the first part, which is the pre foreclosure. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that process and what, what that means? I, I absolutely can. But before I get to that, I want you to understand something. Uh, and, I, and I really appreciate you laying out those three different phases. It's mm -hmm. not just that there are three different phases. People like to think about dealing with the bank as if it's a monolithic entity. It's not. Mm -hmm. Each of those three phases represents a different department who has a completely different agenda. So kind of as an overview, your pre-foreclosure process, that's your customer service group. Okay, Their job is to try and work with a homeowner because the homeowner still owns the property to try and figure out how the bank can get their money back or how they can try and, and limit their losses. The second phase, which is your foreclosure sale, typically is the default servicing. Okay, They don't care if the bank makes money or, or, or not. They're more concerned with how long they have to list a non-performing asset on their stock, for, you know, their stock listing, and how they can recoup the mortgage insurance. The third phase, which is REOs, is the REO department, and at that point, the bank is the owner of the property. They're looking to uh, either make money or or stop the bleeding from having invested in a bad phase. So it don't, you know, where I think a lot of investors and homeowners, for that matter, make a mistake is they think of the bank as a a single entity. Right. It's not. You have to look at each different, you know, incentive that, that the different departments in the bank have at a given time. So to come to your your question about pre foreclosure, pre foreclosure well, is actually, actually you know what? Let, let's oh, let's, let's back, no, that's fine. Let's actually back up a little bit more because I'm I'm thinking you know what we might have people on here that that don't know too much of anything about the the about real estate. So you know, let's back up and actually ask what is a foreclosure? Okay, fantastic question. So when you go to a closing, when somebody buys a house, okay, they typically have to sign three pieces of paper. There's a lot more that goes into it, um, but the three most important pieces of paper is your, your closing disclosure, because that tells you where your money moves, your promissory note, which says who promised, who borrowed the money and who promises to pay it back, and then who signed the mortgage, which is the guarantee for the note. Okay, You can have different parties on each of those three different documents, but in terms of foreclosure, the title, who is the owner of the property, mirrors who's on the mortgage okay and what that means is that somebody's promised to borrow a hundred thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars a million dollars makes no difference whatever that money is the house is the guarantee so if that payment doesn't happen the bank then has one of two choices they can file an action on the note which means they just sue for money i would tell you that 99 times out of 100 they don't do that because once they've chosen to sue on the note they can't foreclose on on the mortgage which is to take the house back the overwhelming majority of time, banks will go and they'll start an action to re reclaim the house to offset the fact that the, the owner who signed the note didn't pay it back. Right. So that's what the foreclosure process is. It's, it's what's called an equitable proceeding. It's not necessarily something that's purely legal. Mm -hmm. The court is asking or so the bank is asking the court to take the extraordinary remedy of taking somebody's ownership interest and transferring it to, to the bank. So they're no longer the owner of the property. Right. Awesome. Cool. So let's go a little bit into the uh, the pre foreclosure process. So in the in the in the note in the mortgage, okay, there's a bunch of notice provisions that say if you're more than 15 days typically late in making a payment, you you are going to be in default. The first step in the pre foreclosure process is the bank has to give a notice saying, "Hey, you you're behind on your payment. How many months? What dollar amount? And pay us or else." Most banks don't even send that notice out until you're at least three months behind because people fall behind for all sorts of legitimate reasons all, all, all the time. Um, so the first phase is somebody sends out a notice says you're behind. Every mortgage uh, of any kind has a right to reinstate in the state of Connecticut. And basically that means is that you've fallen behind, 
you can get caught up. If you pay the bank what you owe them and whatever reasonable fees and costs are, exist to date, you get the house back. Right. What that notice of what that notice of default also does, it notifies the homeowner that if you can't make those payments, you have to start looking for alternatives. And one of the alternatives is give the property back to the bank. They don't really want to do that because they're not in the real estate business. They're not you know, set up to list properties uh, unless they really have to. Right. The other thing they can do, which is part of the pre-foreclosure process, um, is to do a short sale. And a short sale basically means, unfortunately, you thought your house was worth a million dollars. It's worth less today than when you bought it for whatever reason, and you owe more than what the house is worth. So you have every right to pay the bank what you owe them, but if you can't make enough money from the sale of your home, if you owe a million dollars and the house is only worth half a million dollars, that difference has to be made up somewhere. Right. And typically, um, what I usually advise clients is that you offer them a short sale. I would start with a realtor to have them list the property so that you can see what the what the true market value of the property is. Everybody thinks it's worth a million dollars when you own it, and it's worth ten cents when you when you try and sell it. Um, right. But you you need to have that sort of independent valuation. Okay. Once you have a ready, willing, and able buyer and seller, it's got to be an arm's length transaction. You would then essentially ask the bank for permission. Says, I know I owe you a million dollars, but I only have this one asset. It's worth half a million dollars. Would you take that in place? And there's a long convoluted process. Unfortunately, it's gotten more complicated over the years because of mortgage insurance. Um, but the bank is going to go through an analysis of what they think the house is worth, what the mortgage insurance will cover for, for the difference. Sometimes they'll ask the homeowner to be personally responsible to either make up payments or or get a 1098 at the end of the year, you know, to sh showing that they receive some sort of, of income benefit from the debt forgiveness. That's what the foreclosure process, the for pre foreclosure process, really entails. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is that every loan, I don't care if it's private portfolio, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, VA, every loan has some form of mortgage insurance, and most people don't know about it, and most people don't know what that means. Oh. Essentially. Um, Mortgage insurance exists to, to incentivize the bank to make loans to people that they may not otherwise want to take a risk on. Right. If you've ever heard the term factor to dealer incentives, when you're you know, talking about cars, this is the same thing. So whoever the insurance agency is, and a lot, a lot of times we know the, you know the government alphabet soups of those, but whoever the insurance agency is wants to make sure that the bank has started a reasonable collection effort and suffers an ascertainable loss, that gap is what they're going to pay in mortgage insurance and that's what incentivizes the bank to try and accept a short sale because if you have a house that's worth uh, you know half a million dollars and a debt of a million dollars if they're willing to take that half a million dollars they're looking for the other half a million dollars from the mortgage insurance company gotcha All right and that that analysis is, is oftentimes what what takes the, the most amount of time when you're trying to get that approval right and that's in the short sale process in the short sale process Right, right, right. Um, so, so basically, banks aren't usually losing a lot of money, relatively no. speaking. <laughs> it's like going to Vegas; the house yeah. never loses. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Nice, um, cool. So, so now you 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 had you 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 uh, mentioned the term uh, an arm's length transaction. What is that? So an arm's length transaction is is basically a, a deal that's between anybody other than um, family or close friends. So it's right. gotta be something that the market would bear. So you're not going to give a sweetheart deal to uh, a friend or a family member just so that the bank is willing to take less and you're leaving equity in the home or, or, you know, monies that could be paid on the table. The bank wants to make sure that if we substituted the buy your buyer or whoever's selling the house, their buyer for any other buyer, that that deal stands up all on its own as being a, a fair and reasonable deal. Right. Right. Okay. Typically, if you have, you know, mother, father, uh, spouse, children, you know, close relatives, that's yeah. automatically going to be uh, excluded as an arm's length transaction. It's a lot harder if you're dealing with people who have different last names. It's not automatic. Sometimes the bank will ask you to certify um, in some way that, that it is an arm's length transaction. And that's why I like to start with the realtor, because if we know what the, the market value of the property is, Nobody can come back and say that the the economics of the deal make you know make it look like a, it's a bad deal, right? So can you or can you not 
um, sell a property uh, in the pre foreclosure process to a family member? No. You, no, you, the, ba the, the bank will not will not accept that. It's not an arm's length transaction. Right. They want to see what the fair market will will you know will, will turn out on that. Awesome. Um, okay, so now that is the pre foreclosure process. You went over the uh, the short sale and, and and exactly what that is. Um, I also want to uh, buy a foreclosure. Um, I also want to uh, mention that if anybody has any questions, put the uh, the questions in the comment section. Um, and uh, and we'll we'll see if we can get to. We do have a question now. Um, this is um, from Mr. Rosa. Uh, can you buy a foreclosure with a two or three k loan? Yes, you can. Um, yes, you can. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people do. And basically, um, for anyone else out there who doesn't know what a two or three k loan is, it's basically it's a loan product from FHA uh, that that um, allows you to purchase the property. Um, and also borrow the monies to fix the property up. Okay. Um, to keep that short, this is not a, uh, two or three K, um, session, but, uh, that's what a two or three K loan is. And, and yes, you can absolutely. All right. Uh, cool. Again, if anybody else has any questions, throw it in the comment section. All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the auction process. Uh, so that, that is the, uh, the, the next step. So now, um, the, the owners may have tried to sell it. They may have, or they may have not tried to sell it um, via foreclosure, or I'm sorry, via um, a short, short sale. sale that that didn't happen. And now the bank is is uh, actively trying to, uh, to to sell the house. Correct. What does that look like? So oftentimes those two processes are going to happen exactly at the same time. So while the customer service department is trying to work with the homeowner on on a short sale, a deed in lieu, some other kind of pre foreclosure matter. The default servicing department is going to refer to an attorney to start the foreclosure process. Right. Um, on average, you know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have guidelines that say how quickly this should all move forward. Their best case scenario is from start to finish is 90 days. So it's a pretty quick process. Hmm. Uh, realistically, it can take you know several months, especially if you have a, an attorney who's defending you and, and good claims. There's also in Connecticut a, a right for a, anybody who has their own owner-occupied property to seek mediation. In the mediation, it can do it'll do both tracks. You can try and work on the, the pre foreclosure, you know, short sale, or you can try and stipulate to to speed up or, or minimize the damage from the foreclosure. Essentially, the second phase that you're talking about the foreclosure sale is after the bank has completed that that foreclosure process in court. The court is going to look at a couple of things: how much equity is in the house, and if there are any governmental um, liens or interests in the property. If there's IRS or any other federal uh, liens on the property, or if there are um, more than $10,000 worth of equity in the house, meaning the difference between the value of the house and what the debt is owed, the court's going to order a foreclosure by sale. And when they do that, the court appoints an attorney to act as a committee, basically an auctioneer who's going to advertise the sale. They're going to put a sign up in front of the house and on a, on a particular date and time, they're going to, they're going to sell the property. Um, it's not as glamorous as, or, or, or you know, flamboyant as you might think on TV. Nobody's standing there talking really, really quickly. They're not taking bids left and right. It's, it's slower and much more orderly. Right. Um, a lot of people think they can get great deals by going to foreclosure auctions. That it's kind of hit or miss. Okay. Right. For the same reasons that the bank has the considerations in the pre foreclosure about mortgage insurance, 99 times out of 100, the bank is going to bid their debt when they go to the foreclosure auction. So you, you know more or less what the bank's going to bid. Uh, if there's IRS liens, for example, the debt may exceed the value of the house and the bank's going to overbid on it because that's how they protect their mortgage insurance payment. Right. Um, you know, a lot of people think that, I, for example, I just did an auction last week. The property was worth $40,000 on one end because there was fire damage, $140,000 as an ARV or after repaired value. Um, and the property was being foreclosed on for, for property taxes. Uh, the town bid $31,000 and somebody bid, picked it up for $31,002. So depending upon what you as the investor, you as, as you know, the buyer is, is capable of doing, if you have that 203K loan, if you have you know, people that are capable of rebuilding a property, that may have been a great deal. If you don't have that particular skill set, you, you know, that, you know, somebody bought that house with less than $9,000 in equity 
uh, on a property that at that point was ravaged by fire damage. So you really have to do your homework. You have to know what it is. And for the most part, you can't dabble in it. Like th if this is your business model, you want to go into it armed with as many advantages that you can, that you have a contractor that you're comfortable working with. You know how to do your budgeting. Um, you're going into it understanding that you also have to have a certified check for 10% of the court appraised value just to qualify to get into the auction. And you have to be ready to close within 30 days of the court's approval of that auction or you lose your deposit. It's absolutely forfeit. So you, you can make you can make really good deals. You got to do your homework. Uh, the nice part is if you're working with somebody, you know, whether it's me or anybody else um, who's who's done this before, you're not searching around every different you know, newspaper. They do post these on the judicial website, so you can do a lot of your research. You can get uh, appraised values based upon each individual auction that you may be interested in, as well as debt numbers. So you're not going into something to totally blind. You'll know what the bank's numbers are, give or take, and what the what the market value uh, should be. Right. Sure. And yeah, so I'm glad that you that you mentioned that. Um, one thing that I didn't mention in talking about short sales um, it, uh, as it pertains to purchasing short sales is, is the fact that um, a lot of buyers get discouraged um, when buying foreclosure, when buying uh, short sales, because it takes a while. You know, um, like you said, it, it's a lengthy process. There's a lot that's going on in, in the background. Um, so I've had short sales to to go up to uh, six eight months. Um, I've heard of them going longer, um, yes, a, a year or better. You know, um, and that's from the time that you put the offer on the property. The offer gets accepted by the seller, um, and then by the time you actually close, again, it could be six months, eight months, nine months, a year or better. Okay, so um, you know. <sighs> A lot of times that doesn't fit the schedule of home buyers. You know, if, if you're looking for for a new home, you know, for for you and who, whomever else, um, you know, or, or just yourself or whatever the case may be, um, you know, a lot of times that that doesn't really fit what you're looking for as far as the timeline is concerned. All right, so um, that that's something to 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 definitely keep in mind for all those that, that are looking to um to buy a foreclosure or to or to buy it uh, um at at the short sale. Um, phase of this process. Um, there are a lot of pitfalls at the auction as well. And you, you had touched on some. Um, one thing that, that I would like to help people to keep in mind or ask people to keep in mind is that um, you, when there are other liens on a property, you know, at, at the at the auction, you buy it at, at the auction, those become yours, depending on what, which, what lien it is. But uh, you have to pick those up. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, um, you know, what which liens uh, uh, would become the, the new buyers and, and so on and so forth? Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So um, if anybody's interested in buying a property at a foreclosure auction, like I said, you want to go to the judicial website. You want to do all of your research. OK, start with the complaint. The complaint's going to list who the bank is or who the plaintiff is, what liens are prior in right to that that mortgage that's being foreclosed and what liens are uh, junior to the mortgage that's being foreclosed. Anything that's prior and right. So in, in, in really simple terms, if somebody's foreclosing on a second mortgage and there's a prior mortgage, that prior mortgage becomes the new owners at, after the auction. That doesn't get wiped out. It stays in place. Um, you're not obligated on the note, but that means whatever investment you're put, putting in to buy the property, you're putting at risk because there's somebody who can foreclose you out as well. So you got to be prepared to deal with them and try and work out a second deal after your closing. Um, anything that's listed in the, in the complaint as being junior or after the mortgage that's being foreclosed, those can be tax liens. It could be, you know, judgment liens, a, a second or third mortgage. Those will all be wiped out with the exception of municipal taxes. So if you see somebody who's got child support liens, uh, uh, state tax liens, those all go away. IRS liens, those all go away. But your property taxes don't, and things like water and sewer do not go away. Right. Um, individual utilities, so things like cable, internet, uh, you know, electricity. If those are if those are encumbrances on the property, um, those will go. You know, water and sewer will not because they're tied to being municipal services. But anything else that's you know electric, cable. Um, those all will go away because they're going to be individualized to the former owner who got foreclosed out. 
So you really want to watch out for things like water and sewer. You want to watch out for you know uh, municipal taxes, water, sewer, blight liens, um, car taxes. Sometimes anything that's a that's a municipal charge. And then you also want to do your own title search or have your attorney do a title search because if anything got missed, that means it's not getting wiped out by the foreclosure auction and it will stay. And not only will it stay, it'll be prior to your interest as the new buyer. So don't take it for granted that, that the bank or the attorney representing the bank knew what they were doing. Um, do your own, you know, do your own title search. What is a title search? Great question. So um, Connecticut is what's called a title theory state, which means any interest in real estate has to be written down and it has to be filed with the town clerk where the property is located. So a title search very literally means that somebody's going to go back and they're going to start from the day of the search. They're going to go backward. You know, usually we do them 40 to 50 years, but it can be any, any period of time. And then from that date, they're going to go all the way back to the beginning to make sure you know what liens, mortgages, judgments, encumbrances of any kind are attached to the property. So for example, when you have a closing and you sign your note mortgage and your closing disclosure, the mortgage gets recorded in town hall, as does the deed that transfers ownership interest. So some places outside of Connecticut, um, if I give you a deed and you accept the deed and you give me money, you're the owner as of that instant, not in the state of Connecticut. Right. State of Connecticut, it's not real until you take that deed and you then go file it with the town clerk. When you file it with the town clerk, they give you a, a volume and page number. That's kind of your, your indexing. That identifies where you are in, in the continuum of interests from the 1600s, you know, when it, whenever the, you know, the, the property was, was first dedicated all the way to today. Right. Right. So, yeah, so it's important to get title insurance for, for all, for all those reasons. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you don't want to be in a situation where it's um, amongst many things, you know, whereas the, the, the owner that owned it, three owners before me, they, they have a, an auntie that, that, that said that, uh, well, my, my mother was supposed to deed this property to me. You know what I mean? Um, and she has something written down, you know, say stating that that um, you know, that it's supposed to be her property. That could be an issue. That's that's one reason, uh, in layman's terms, to to, to get a um a, a a title search done. Exactly. And and if you've ever listened to the radio recently, you know, I hear commercials all the time for this company or companies like this called Title Lock, and they talk about how somebody can steal your home title. It doesn't work exactly that way in the state of Connecticut because of that indexing and the requirement that, th that they be there. But that's exactly the same thing. You want to know who the owner is, that when you're buying the, this piece of property, what debts are coming with it, uh, you may have to inherit or, 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 or get stuck with, and, and what's not no longer there. So the title search is really important. Um, it, it's a fairly inexpensive uh, process to try and, and do a lot of background research on on what debts encumber your property. Cool, cool. And now we'll move on to the <coughs> um, bank owned, uh, the, the uh, real estate owned, REO, whatever you want to call it, it goes by so yep. many names. Um, and that is basically where is now the bank owns the property. Exactly. Uh, and that's the big. That's the biggest difference of, of, of all. Not to cut you off, so I apologize. Um, in the first two sections, you're dealing with a homeowner. Okay, even in, even in the foreclosure auction, until the bank confirms the sale, the homeowner is still involved, and the bank is also involved, whether they're approving a short sale or, or whether they're selling the property. There's nobody but the bank involved once you get to the REO phase. Okay, some people call it OREO, which is other real estate owned, but basically that that's this big cache of properties that the bank owns after the foreclosure. Okay, typically. Right after the foreclosure, it takes a while to get to the REO phase because the bank is going to go through that mortgage insurance process. Depending on who the, the mortgage insurance uh, provider is, they may require the property to be resold until they can determine exactly how, how much they owe or are willing to pay on, on the REO side. Um, the most common things you're going to see are, are things like auction.com or it may go up to a realtor who's gonna list it in, in a more traditional sense. Uh, but that's how the bank liquidates the asset, the house, after they've taken back after either a foreclosure or what's called a deed in lieu. Okay, a deed in lieu is another thing that, that happens in, in, or another process in the pre-foreclosure phase where if the property can't be sold as kind of a, a settlement, instead of going through that whole lengthy foreclosure process, the homeowner will sign a deed or deed in lieu uh, giving that property back to the bank. 
So the bank takes it back one of two ways. And then their mindset really changes in that third phase when it's in REO, it's no longer a consideration what the debt was or how much money the bank may have, have lo loaned out or lost previously. They're really stuck with what the property is, um, what its value is presently. They're going to do an internal calculation in terms of what, how, how much or how little repair work needs to be done to make it marketable in the most profitable way for them. So um, a good rule of thumb, both in the REO phase and in the, in the uh, short sale phase is 88%. Okay? Right. The banks always want to get a minimum of 88% of what the fair market value of it, not what you think it's worth, but what the bank is going to determine that worth to be. So if you got a property that's worth $100,000 and you say, look, they'd be lucky to take $50,000. I'm a cash buyer. I'm ready to do it. They don't care. Right. It's not up to their financial standards. So that 88% is, is not a hard and fast rule, but it's, you know, in my experience, that's a pretty good bright line to start working with. Right. That's, that's good information. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, 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 you know, like you're saying that that's um, at this phase, the, the bank owns the property. And, and how they sell these properties is by hiring a real estate agent, okay? Um, Usually. So, so not to cut yeah. you off, but again, yeah. sometimes they'll use the online auctions. Like I said, yep. auction.com is probably the biggest one that's out there. And in either case, whether it's a traditional realtor or one of these online sales, you right. want to be careful when you're dealing with the bank because th you're not getting your standard pre-printed uh, contract. You're getting the bank's contract. And oftentimes... Right. They try and pawn off some of the seller responsibilities, some of the reps and warranties that, that a traditional seller may normally make. The bank's not going to make because they've never lived there. They don't know anything about the property. It's an asset on the books. Um, oftentimes, they, they will also try and force you to take their title insurance policy and they dress it up as if, hey, we're, we'll cover your closing costs. We'll cover. Don't ever do that. Okay. Worst possible thing you can possibly do is take something from the seller, especially if the seller is the bank. Because when they take back the property, they get a brand new policy, uh, title insurance policy. That title insurance policy is going to assume that they did the, the foreclosure correctly. Oh. If there's anything that they missed and you've accepted their policy, again, you're accepting all of their mistakes. So right. it's, it's a fairly minimal charge. Go hire an attorney. Go get a title insurance policy and protect yourself. Same reason that you don't take their free attorney because you can only have, you know, attorney can only represent one client. If right. the attorney represents the bank, and they're also representing you, that means they are also representing the bank. They don't have your interests exclusively at heart. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, good, good information. Absolutely. For sure. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so, so what, when, when it's a bank owned property and it's listed with, with, with an agent, um, that is all the properties. If you guys follow me on, um, on my social media channels, um, YouTube and, uh, Instagram and all that, where I post these properties, many times that that's what those properties are. They're, they're, they're foreclosure properties. All right. Um, and so what the bank does many times is, is that, uh, in this, this, um, phase of the foreclosure process, they will, they'll listen with a real estate agent. Um, and it's, it's a, a, a bank owned REO property. Uh, and basically that, that transaction goes very, very similar to that of, buying it from, from anyone else when it's listed on the MLS. Okay. Um, so basically you, you find a property, whether it be on Zillow, realtor.com, or even if you're working with a real estate agent um, and they, and the real estate agent um, sends you this property, you find out that it's a foreclosure process. Again, many times buying those foreclosures, it's, it's the same depending on who it is. HUD is very different. Uh, there, there are, different <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about that as I'm going. Uh, but many times it, it's it's pretty much the same as as when you're um, purchasing from um, from a, um, a, a an actual person. All right. Paperwork is different depending on the bank or, or who, who owns the property and so on and so forth. But for the most part, it's pretty much uh, pretty much the, the same across the board. All right. Um, so you, you talked a little bit about, about auctions. That's actually what, what I want to talk about next. Um, right. So now buying it at, at auction, what phase are we in? With, uh, with with buying it at the auctions, like so on, on auction.com or, or uh, yeah, that, that's, those type of auctions, auction.com or right. the different, uh, internet auction sites. So things like auction.com and Zoom, and, and there's a bunch of them out, out there now, they keep, they keep popping up and changing names. Um, that's really in that REO phase. So, yeah. so, you know, the bank, nobody who works for the bank, uh, even in the REO department, 
has a real estate license or, or is qualified to do this. They're, they're bean counters, number crunchers, whatever you want to call them. And they're looking at a list of assets in a given state or area within the state that they need to have sold to then compare to get the mortgage insurance money back. So they will use either a traditional realtor or the, you know, the, the big push right now is to do everything online. Okay, so instead of having brick and mortar, it's all click and order. You put it online, they can have, you know, whatever uh, minimum reserves that they have. There's a little bit more control, you know, from, from the bank's perspective about doing these online auctions because um, if the bank thinks that the property is worth a particular number and you've got to go through this um, kind of, you know, cold computer to make an, to make an offer, you're not negotiating. You're not talking to somebody face to face. You know where you'd have a traditional realtor and say, "Hey, look, I really like this house, but here's all the list of prop of problems with with that house. You know, can you look into it?" You're not doing that on an online auction. They're coming up and, and asking you, "Do you want to bid or do you not want to bid?" Right. Um, so that you know the banks are moving more and more into that that phase because it's faster, it's less expensive to them to have the hosting fees for for an auction site than it is to pay a six percent commission to a realtor. Um, the danger for investors and, and, and people looking to buy property from the auction sites is they don't always have access. Uh, where you talk to a traditional realtor, they're going to have a lockbox or a key. You can go in, you can try and do a little bit you know, more than you, than you could on, a, on an auction site uh, to go in and do your own inspections. And the second thing is there is going to be a large addendum. Um, like I was, I was mentioning before, you've got to accept whatever th those auction rules are. Oftentimes in the auction rules, they're having you pay some sort of a, of a buyer's premium. Um, you've got to wire money directly to the auction site if you're the successful bidder within it's usually either 24 or 72 hours um, to, to otherwise you lose your bid and they just put it right back up on the auction. Uh, some of some of these terms um, are going to go outside of what you can do in Connecticut. You know, just because you're buying an auction property from auction.com doesn't mean that the bank is located in Connecticut or knows anything about Connecticut law. Oftentimes, I've I've had you know big struggles with banks when they're trying to uh, trying to pawn off on a buyer um, things like the conveyance tax, which is a seller's responsibility under under our laws. Um, if there is a realtor, they'll try and pawn off some of those other closing costs: water, sewer. Uh, any sort of adjustments that you would normally have when you buy a property from an from an individual seller, the bank's just going to say we're we're selling it as is, where is with all the faults and, and problems. So everything that we talked about earlier with the foreclosure auction, you know, in the in the judgment phase, you want to make sure you do that homework leading up to your bidding because once you once you send that deposit and if you find out there was a mortgage that was missed, there was something that wasn't disclosed, um, you're putting your deposit at risk because they don't care. Absolutely. For sure. Um, so what can people do? Uh, I'm actually going to talk to a different audience right now because right. so far what we've been talking about um, uh, purchasing foreclosure properties. What can someone do that that's in foreclosure or, or, or thinks that they might go into foreclosure? Maybe they're facing uh, some issues due to the whole COVID thing. Um, what, what can someone do um, at, at, at this point to not lose their, their home to foreclosure or investment property to foreclosure? Okay, um, great question, and and probably the most thing, most important thing we're going to talk about. Uh, the the best thing that somebody can do is be proactive with it. Okay, if you put your head in the sand and you and you think, okay, I'll deal with it later, or I'm I'm embarrassed, I I you know I'll have more money down the line. Worst thing you can do, try and get out ahead of this as fast as you can. Um, if you're an investor versus a homeowner, a little bit different situation because that whole mortgage insurance um, and, and incentives for the bank will be very different for owner-occupied property than it will be for investor or second home or, or anything that's not traditionally owner-occupied. Uh, either way, contact your mortgage company. Okay, um, if they're if they're not able to do something with you, um, oftentimes what you can do is you can ask them to do some sort of a, of a loan modification. Okay, that loan modification, depending on how far along you are in your ownership tenure, may be you know, redoing the interest rate, maybe you know, uh, lengthening the term, maybe putting some of the money that you owe on, on the back end of your loan. It may be you know, they're going to help you do a, a full-blown refinance. Um, an internal modification is much easier to do, but they're not going to do that you know, every year, every six months if this becomes habitual. You, know, you, you really want to be able to describe with some kind of particularity um, what caused you to go into this problem. It could be something as simple as, as a downturn due to COVID. It could be because of, of loss of, of, of hours, change in your rate, 
you know, family situations, medical bills. Uh, you don't have to have a long prepared story. You know, okay, so oftentimes less is more, but you got to give them a reason. Okay, right. what was your, you know, the, what the term is? They want to know what the hardship was that caused this, and then, and the reason it's a hardship is that it's not going to spring up every two months or three months. Okay, if you tell them, hey, I, I couldn't afford my mortgage because I'm a habitual gambler, they're not going to do. They're not going to work with you. Right. Um, you know, if if you had medical expenses, you're not going to have medical expenses. You know, periodically, it, it's a one time freak accident that it happens. Um, and the banks will often be willing to work with you. If they're not willing to work with you right off the bat, then you want to hire, you know, you can, there are actual short sale negotiators and, and debt negotiators that you can hire. Um, I usually think that, that going to an attorney is, is probably um, maybe a little bit more expensive, but it's certainly a better option because if they're not going to deal with you on, on, on the easy side of things, you're looking at the, the legal process starting sooner or later. And those debt negotiators are not going to be able to help you in court. Right. So it, it's not, you know, I'm not going to tell you, you know, at all that just because somebody calls me and, and all of a sudden, you know, the attorney calls the bank, they're quaking in their boots, not going to happen at all. But you're dealing with somebody who's sort of on a par level. The bank's going to give it to an attorney. If I'm, you know, if I'm talking to a, another attorney, they understand what I can and can't do, what's within my arsenal to try and, and make their life miserable on behalf of my client and why it's it's more in their best interest to work with us if we can come up with a reasonable plan. Cool. Cool. Awesome. Uh, good information for sure. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, what? I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about something else. Um, I'm gonna have a little commercial break first. So actually, I'm, I'm going to I just want to talk really quickly about uh, if you are looking for a foreclosure property. If you are looking for any property, um, then uh, definitely hit me up. I have I have a uh, my cell phone number right there. Um, I have a deals by text service that I offer. All right for for uh, for any of those that are looking. This is specifically actually this is specifically for, for those that are looking for investment property. If you're looking for investment property, um, text this number. Just let me know what city or town you, that you're looking in. Um, and uh, that's all you got to write. I'm looking in Meriden, I'm looking in Waterbury, I'm looking in New Haven, whatever the case may be. All right. Um, just text me what whatever city Tom, that you're looking in. And um, whenever I come across a great deal, I'll shoot it your way. It's just that simple. All right. Um, so that my cell phone number is right there. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, evictions. All right. Hot topic right now. It's hard, pretty much impossible to evict anybody right now due to the, uh, the, the moratorium on, on evictions. Um, they did extend that until January 1st, uh, 2021. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what landlords, and then we'll also talk about what tenants can do, uh, to prepare for that. Um, if they, if a landlord has tenants that they know, you know, Hey, listen, this person isn't paying. And, you know, obviously with everything that's going on, there are people that can't pay. Okay. Um, there are also people that, that, um, that that won't pay because of the what they call it the um cancel the rent movement okay uh so they just feel like you know what COVID happened i ain't got to pay my rent all right so um regardless of what boat your tenants are in um you know what should you do to uh to prepare for for, for that for that time for january 1st if it doesn't get extended uh further what should you do to, pre to prepare for that also for the tenants what sh what should uh what should tenants do to prepare for uh for that time again if it doesn't get extended after january 1st so you're absolutely right. This is an incredibly hot topic right now. And, and you know, we, my partner and I uh, have been have been pouring over all of the changes that are happening almost daily in, in terms of uh, evictions and housing matters. Uh, so the first thing I would first way I'd answer your question is that it actually applies to both landlords and tenants. All right. Uh, they did. Ex the, the governor did issue a new executive order that extends the for the eviction moratorium through the end of the year. But there's some exceptions to it. There's also a, a rental protection program, which is where this impacts both landlords and tenants. Um, there's money that's available through the state of Connecticut to try and help people who legitimately can't pay their rent but are really trying. Okay, right. uh, there's. Um, I would tell you to contact me off offline. It, it's a little bit more uh, complicated than I could tell you over here. But basically, the the tenant can apply to the state. They would fill out an application that explains what their hardship was, what their rent is, how far they are in arrears. Um, the state is going to evaluate the application together with identification of who the, the landlord is to try and get a direct payment to the landlord to offset that, that hardship. 
Okay. And, you know, that's been much more important in this most recent extension because look, if you're, if you're a landlord and your tenants are not able to pay their rent, your bills are still due, your utilities are still due, your taxes are still due. So this is, you know, in, it's not a great solution, but it, it's at least a recognition that the hardship that's falling on tenants, most of whom is, is very legitimate, is also having a, a, you know, a downstream effect on landlords. It's also going to have a downstream effect on municipalities who are trying to collect their taxes. Uh, right now, the most recent studies are predicting a 45 to 50 percent increase in foreclosures and evictions come January 1st. Um, that, that's going to be hugely problematic even leaving aside the fact that the courts aren't set up to handle the situation right now, let alone that, that kind of a bubble down there. So uh, if you are at all struggling with uh, paying your rent, there are certain solutions. Just like I said before, with, with the foreclosure, the best thing you can do is try and be proactive. Okay? And also understand that forbearance is not forgiveness. Just because you're, you're being told that you don't have to make this, it's not canceling the rent. That rent is still gonna continue to accrue and down the line, everybody has to pay the piper. So you're better off trying to work with your landlord, use the opportunities that the state's making available to make those payments before it becomes you know, really improbable that you can, you can do that. Um, from the landlord perspective, yes, there, there are no uh, evictions that can go forward through the end of the year with four very um, important exceptions, okay? One, if you, if you have a debt that accrued prior to the month, prior to March of 2020. So if you, somebody, somebody was behind in their rent back in the months of January, February, um, you can continue to evict that person, mm. okay? Uh, the second reason is in the event of a serious nuisance, okay? Serious nuisance is a little bit harder to prove um, and, it, and it essentially comes up to almost a criminal standard. You have to so show somebody didn't just come and squat in the property. They didn't just break in, but they're actively committing crimes and 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 you know, um, uh, you know, they're running a prostitution ring. They're committing murders. They're they're doing things that are putting people's lives in danger. That's a serious nuisance. Okay, typically for that, you know, I would tell clients you got to get a police report. You have to have something that justifies it. You can't simply claim that something is a serious nuisance. Right. Okay, the third one is a super delinquency and, and what the state has defined in this most recent executive order as a super delinquency is if you have more than six months in arrears so that cancel the you know cancel the lease provision is going to go out of the way really quickly if we've been you know everybody's been sort of in lockdown since march we're already more than six months out if somebody hasn't made a payment in more than six months they can be susceptible to to a new eviction process right now mm. the fourth condition is if you're a smaller investor, let's say I've got a client right now, uh, they live in Connecticut, husband got a job in Massachusetts, so they left and they rented out their house. That job just got canceled because you know everything else is getting downsized and they need to come back home. If you're a, a homeowner and you're intending to retake your, your own personal property as your primary residence, you can go forward with an eviction. And that's a new, new change that wasn't in any of the previous executive orders. Again, you have to be able to document it. You can't just say it. You have to be able to show that what your hardship is that requires you to move back into the house to make that declaration that you are going to move into your house as your primary residence. And yeah, you actually have to do it. Right. Um, but except for, you know, un unless it's one of those four exceptions, you're you're stuck uh, in each of those cases. You know, again, not only the, the four exceptions that I talked about, but, you know, if somebody is, is trying to, you know, avoid an eviction, there is a declaration that has to be filed. And there's a lot of confusion about how that gets filed, okay? Um, there was an order that came out by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, that, that requires tenants to fill out an app, uh, a, a, almost like an affidavit, a declaration that states what their hardship is and that, and that they can't, not only can they not pay their rent, uh, but they have nowhere to go and that it would be completely unhealthy to be outdoors or in shelters or somewhere else because of COVID. That form is available in both English and Spanish. Um, if you are a, a tenant and you are having hardships, make sure you find that form, send it to your landlord. If you are a landlord and you're trying to evict somebody because they fall into one of those four categories, you have to send your tenant that app, that declaration in English and in Spanish. And if they send it back and, and meet 
certain criteria, you may be you know prevented from going forward anyways. So there's a lot of moving parts to to the eviction process. Um, I just read a decision from a judge that I, I really respect, um, and and you know he was very right. You know nobody wins in an eviction process. Not okay, really. in a in a perfect world, the tenant has a place to live, and the landlord gets money for for their place. That's how the system is set up to to work. If either of those th those things don't happen, everybody loses. So it's it, it's a tough it's a tough boat to be in. Uh, there are solutions to you, but you have to know what you're doing and, and how to do it. I'd also you know put out a little bit of a warning for investors and landlords. Uh, if you if you try and cut corners, um, there are civil penalties, especially during COVID, that can run anywhere from ten thousand to a hundred thousand uh, dollars in fines. And those aren't just you know the, the towns issuing fines; those are federal fines. Okay. True. Um, so how long does, does an eviction, uh, a couple questions, how long mm -hmm. does an eviction usually last? How much longer do you think an eviction will, will usually last or, or will last, you know, going forward? Um, and if the eviction moratorium ends January 1st, that's the winter time. There, yeah. there's, a, there there's a lot of people out there that, that believe that you cannot be evicted in the winter time period. Is that true? So on and so forth. Okay. So from, from the beginning, your typical eviction should run you anywhere from 30 to 90 days. Okay. Um, sure. it, there's, there's a really wide swing depending upon how many tenants there are. Um, you know, how, how you make service. Does anybody have a legitimate gripe as far as a landlord not doing their, their responsibilities under the lease? Uh, but typically 30 to 90 days is how long a, a, a an eviction process should take. Um, it, with COVID and everything else that's going on, the courts are, are absolutely shut down. Uh, they're starting to reopen. And the housing court, which is an absolute subset of the regular superior court, is moving at a very different pace. So depending upon what town or judicial district you may be in, um, it, it could take, you know, two or three times that, that length of time. Um, the court, from talking to the chief court administrator for the housing court, um, those four exceptions should go back to the original um, timelines that, that we're dealing with. The courts are are getting set up to try and have virtual hearings that'll look a lot like the, you know this call that we're doing right now, uh, where people can call in if they can't you know can't do anything either in person or they can't uh, set up a video chat. Um, so at least the, there's an orderly process in those four circumstances. Um, as far as you know, January first. I had a judge who, who's nowhere near retirement age um, change his tune on me during during a, a video deposition one or a, a video conference one time where he basically said we're never going to get caught up on the old cases, let alone get all the new cases before he's ready to retire. So uh, I I have grave concerns about the speed and efficiency that this process can move forward. Um, you know, coming up to, to January first, only because if you think about um, think about a garden hose. You can only push so much water out of the garden hose at any given time. There's only so many resources. There's only so much time a judge or, or a court mediator has to do the work that they need to do. Um, lawyers are really good about playing games with the system and causing delays if they think it's in their client's best interest. Mm -hmm. So if January 1st rolls around and people are playing games and all of a sudden you have this 45 to 50 percent influx of brand new cases because everybody's off to the races, you're going to put a bowling ball through that that garden hose and things are going to get stuck and delayed. Doesn't mean that you're going to have a case that's automatically going to take, you know, go from, you know, 90 days to, to, you know, nine months. Um, but there are, there are grave concerns about how, how well the process is going to work after that. Right. Um, I know the court's working on additional resources. Uh, if they don't have to have people in courtrooms, maybe there's more money and, and more resources that can go to have additional judges available, additional mediators available, um, always the best way to do these things is by stipulation. So if we can get a landlord and a tenant uh, to come up with some sort of an agreement on how long a tenant can stay before they have to be uh, out, of, out of the property and we don't have to go to the extraordinary re you know, remedy of physically moving them out with a marshal and a moving company, um, that's better for everybody, you know, even in those, those really tough circumstances. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is it, is it true or is it a myth that, that people cannot be evicted minus COVID uh, in the wintertime? Absolutely a myth. Um, absolutely a myth. You can be evicted anytime, any place for any reason. Right. Um, you know, the, the biggest determining factor as far as when you can be evicted really is the courts have to consider 
worst case scenario, if they say you've got 10 days to get out and you're not out, the, the landlord can apply for what's called an execution for ejectment. It's a horrible name, but it basically is an order that allows the, the landlord to hire a marshal to physically move you and your belongings out of the house. Right. In that process, the, the marshal is going to hire a moving company and they have to have people that can take the stuff out and put it into some sort of secured storage that doesn't cost either, either the town or the, um, the tenant so much money that it makes it prohibitive. So, you know, perhaps, you know, the, the myth comes from the fact that there, it may be a little bit tougher in the winter time to have those storage facilities or to schedule move outs just because of, you know, snow and, and trucks and availability. But no, you can move somebody out anytime for for any reason. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a quick story. It's one that I'm not necessarily proud of, but it, 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 it works well with your, your question. Um, I was representing a landlord one time. Um, we were doing an eviction and uh, it, it was in early November. Uh, we had a judgment. The, the tenant came in and, and filed an application to stay the execution because she needed more time. Mm -hmm. uh, lady walks into court. She's there surrounded by her family. Um, she was a minority. Um, she was visibly probably seven or eight months pregnant, mm -hmm. another, another kid in tow and we're heading into Thanksgiving. And I thought I was cooked <laughs> and I, and I made the argument that, um, under Connecticut law, you're only allowed a maximum of, um, six months as an extension. She had already, you know, she was already into her first extension. An additional extension would have, would have put her through at that point, November, December, January. So by February, the coldest time of the year. Um, she would have given birth to a new child and and had to the court would be without power to get her out of the property in mm -hmm. the worst coldest time of of the year. And I I was winging this. Yeah, I'd be lying if I didn't say otherwise. I said, look, she she's here with her family, and at least now we know that she has a support system that can help her land on her feet mm -hmm. and be safe for herself and her and and her you know un, unborn child. Right. I thought I had no shot in the world. You know, wow. go leading into the holiday season. Well, wow. of course, they're going to give her more time and they didn't. Mm. Um, my client, who was the landlord, was exceptionally happy. Um, I'm sure, you know, this lady and her family were not. I'd like to think that at the, at the end of the day, it was really the best thing for her. I wasn't just riffing, but, you know, you got to take things into consideration. You, you know, the, you always have to pay the piper. So mm -hmm. if you're trying to get an extension or you're trying to say, well, you can't do this to me now, you have to do it to me later. Eventually it's going to happen. Right. So. You know, if, if you think that you can't evict somebody in the winter or you can't be evicted during the winter, absolutely not. You know, you can be evicted anytime. It's all a matter of facts and circumstances. And most of those are not even in your control as, as the tenant. Right. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I actually um, I actually had an eviction that uh, the person had to be out December 23rd. <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't planned that way. I filed the eviction. In, in August, it yep. just got dragged out, and that's when the person had to end up leaving. Um, unfortunate, but you know, things happen. Yep. Um, so yeah, so listen, I really appreciate. Oh boy, how much energy I got on my uh, Mac? Okay, we're good. All right. Um, <laughs> so I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to speak to myself and everyone that that's listening here. I hope that everyone uh, got something from this. I'm pretty sure that you did. Uh, if you're gonna watch this, or if you are watching this in the replay. Again, you know, uh, it's perfectly fine. Just leave me a um, a comment in the comment section. Uh, Attorney Rosenberg, you know, I, I'll, I'll reach out to him if I can answer the, the question myself. Um, and uh, you know, I just want to answer everybody's questions. I want everybody to uh, to walk away from from this uh, a little bit more knowledgeable. So, um, again, I, de I definitely want to thank you for uh, for taking the time to uh, to speak with us today. Um, so I have your information right here, but, um, if you want to go into a little bit, you know, just who you are and, and how people can contact you, that'd be great. Absolutely. I look, I, I appreciate it. I, I always, you know, love working with, with, you know, realtors such as yourself and you do a great job. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and, and, and anybody on, on your social media sites. Uh, like you see, my name's Dave Rosenberg. I, I'm an attorney with a company in, in uh, Hamden called Gambardella Cipriano Gottlieb and Hathaway, which is too long for us to say. So we just call it GCGH law. Uh, the names right there behind me. They make sure I have that that handy post for when I talk to the judges. Um, this is what I do. I'm, I'm a real estate attorney. Um, I do everything from you know closings, uh, residential, commercial evictions, 
and and what makes you know my practice a little bit different is I do all the litigation that's related to it. So when we talk about foreclosures or foreclosure defense or debt collection or evictions, I'm actually the guy who will not only do the paperwork but but go to uh, court on that as well. Um, we're a medium sized shop. We're we're seven attorneys, twenty support staff. This is what we do. Nobody dabbles in anybody's criminal or or, or uh, you know bankruptcy work. I've got great referrals for all of that, but this is what we do, and we cover the whole state. Um, on the real estate side, you know, we also have ties to um, you know partner firms in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, I'm not personally licensed over there, so I'm not you know offended if if you never call me for that. But anywhere throughout, I've, I've been to every town in in every corner of the state. Um, I don't work banker hours, so. The number that's at the bottom of your screen is my cell phone. It's 203-444-1264. You can call me, text me. Um, happy to get back to you. Email is probably the best way to reach me because I will always you know, have that and I will always be able to get back to you. And that's david at gcghlaw.com. Um, even if you don't want to hire me or you don't need to hire me for something, if you've got questions or concerned about something you know, having to do with real estate or anything at all, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And like I said, if I'm not the right person for the job, I'll be able to point you in, in the right direction of where that is. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So um, once again, I thank you for uh, for doing this. Um, I think that brings us to a close. I got 5% left on my Mac, so we're going to end this quick. All right. Um, so that's all I got for you guys for today. As always,